So, as I was saying before in our uh, last uh, discussion, um, that it was very important for us at the end of the day to go really into taking action. And uh, this format is a very uh, specific one, which is going to follow, because we're going to research a little bit some options also about the open source investigation, because it has emerged, as I was saying, as a unique and powerful form of journalism. What can digital investigators and documentary filmmakers learn from each other is what we wanted to um, uh, inquire into. What are risks, but also ethical dilemmas coming with unveiling secrets of corporations and governments? We invited uh, Charlotte Godard, an investigator and trainer for Bellingcat, and um, from the US, this is why uh, we have them at the end of the day, and uh, we also have Daniel Andreas Zaga, uh, director, journalist and producer of the feature documentary Behind the Headlines, which is screening here at the festival. And uh, the discussion will be led by Julia Kuberlein. She's the CEO and the co-founder of Context Labs. I really highly recommend you to have a look. A digital company to communicate complex content in multidimensional knowledge maps. It's interesting because it is also very recontextualizing, so to speak. So before we go into this discussion, I think it would be a great opportunity to have a look at the trailer of Behind the Headlines. I love the title, Behind the Headlines, and we are going to go also behind the headlines in the discussion about investigative journalism and documentary filmmaking. Can we please have the trailer? We would be very, very much interested to talk to you. We would stay very confidential, of course, in the background. We never talk. No one will ever know that we met. I must very clearly say, investigative journalism lives to both sides of Whistleblower. Now we are entering this darker moment that everybody can see, everybody can feel. Uh, things are changing. And if we don't stop that, if journalists aren't thinking on that scale, where is that going to lead us? Zu recherchieren. Das ist eine Kollegin, die hat auch an den Panama Papers gearbeitet und die wurde durch eine Autobombe getötet. Wir wollen, dass die Leute sich merken, wenn sie eine Journalistin töten, dann wird ihre Geschichte ja mehr Aufmerksamkeit kriegen als weniger. Der gilt als die große Nummer im Geschäft mit Massenvernichtungswaffen. Das ist so das Heftige. Du merkst, dass er so in diesen Behördenkreisen eine Nummer ist. Und trotzdem hast du von dem noch nichts gehört. Ja. Wir wurden angesprochen von jemandem, der uns Material vorführen wollte, von dem Leute glauben, dass es großes Potenzial hat, eine Regierung zu stürzen. Wenn auch nur die Hälfte von dem Zeug stimmt, dann zerschießt es die ganze Partei. Die fragen nicht nach einem Pass, die wissen nicht, wer sie ist. Die treffen sich mit denen und die reden mit denen Geld und versprechen denen irgendwie halb Österreich. Irgendwie kann es sein, dass uns jemand eine Falle stellt hier. Texte sind schon, also die Texte sind schon, die meisten sind schon bei, die haben, glaube ich, fünf oder sechs Texte oben liegen. Das ist so eine Nervositätsspirale. Es werden alle immer nervöser und 
ich glaube, dass diese Spirale in einer Veröffentlichung enden wird. Und dann weiß ich auch nicht, was dann passiert. Dann explodiert es. When when I watch this trailer and maybe the film, I would say this is to be a white man um, world. <laughs> so this is why I'm especially uh, happy to have Charlotte Godard here from Bellingcat and uh, the talk moderated also by Julia Kuberlein together with um, um, sorry, uh, Daniel Andreas uh, Zager, the director and the producer of the film. I'll let you uh, lead the conversation now, Julia, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be super interesting and I'm going to watch it from the studio. Um, yeah, thank you very much, AC, and a very warm welcome to a session full of investigation. Um, free press, media and journalism are building one of the foundations of our democracy, um, as you might have seen in the trailer as well. Um, and especially investigative researchers are digging deeper to challenge the authorities of governments and corporations. With their work, they make a special contribution to the freedom of society and protect against the abuse of power by exposing wrongdoing. So um, this is why I'm really very happy to introduce now to you two protagonists. Um, as a contributor, I want to welcome Charlotte. She's working for Bellingcat, an investigative research platform, or in other words, as she called it, a research collective using mainly open source data. Before uh, Charlotte started working for Bellingcat two years ago, she uh, used to work for NGOs like the Human Rights Center, um, where she learned to work with investigative research methods and immediately sparked interest. Um, at Bellingcat, she works now as an investigative researcher and trainer. And I want to welcome Daniel. Um, he is also an observer of, he is kind of an observer of investigative journalism. Um, as a documentary filmmaker, he also used to work as a journalist um, so he has been somehow walking in both pairs of shoes. Um, as direct director of Behind the Headlines, he observed for two years one German investigative research team. Um, we just saw the trailer of Behind the Headlines, and this is why I want to start uh, my uh, very first question to Daniel, um, to ask Daniel. Um, Daniel, why did you choose um, to portray the work of investigators um, and what exactly sparked your interest and uh, what was the main goal um, of this documentary? <laughs> so I know a bunch of questions, but... <laughs> yeah, so of course I had also um, um, lots of discussions uh, in the past uh, about the media and the press uh, with people um, I'm surrounded from and um, what I actually realized that there were lots of people uh, who doubt the media and um, also spoke always of the media, very generalized. And um, what I also recognized is they that they didn't uh, not know how journalists work and that there are like um, um, specific rules um, they have to work um, for and. Um, so I wanted uh, to give a really um, open view on the journalistic craft and uh, how journalists work and that they are very um, different individuals uh, discussing with each other um, and um, who are, yeah, try to um, have uh, open conversations about what, uh, what kind of stories uh, do they produce and how do they produce it. Um, and uh, this is why I started to working on this film. So, but um, um, investigative journalists are not the same work doing as uh, news journalists, for example, mostly. Um, how would you distinguish this and why did you uh, want to capture especially the investigative, investigative work? <laughs> Yes, uh, because uh, news journalists, the news business got so fast, it's uh, more and more just about being the first and bringing, um, yeah, maybe um, just like random news uh, as fast as possible on a website. And investigative journalists um, 
is um, yeah, much more complex and also very, um, for me, I think it's uh, very important for democracy and for a free society. Um, and uh, they, uh, investigative journalists, try to find something out which is um, not known so far. Um, and they are like a political watchdog of the society. So they have a look on politicians, uh, what they do, but um, also um, on uh, the um, economy and on specific persons in the public. So I think uh, it's a uh, very um, investigative journalism is very important. And this is why I uh, chose to have um, like a closer look on that. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I want to dig a little deeper in your decision making. <laughs> so, um, as I, I see uh, uh, mentioned uh, before, it's, it looked like a male world, so um, a white white male's uh, world a little bit in the in the trailer. Um, and I think there are many diverse uh, investigative research teams. Why did you exactly choose? to portray this team from the from the Süddeutsche Zeitung? Um, so I think, um, yeah, journalism might be still um, um, a field which is dominated by white men, uh, which is not good. I would also wish um, for my film uh, more diversity. But I, um, what I want to say also is um, that um, for myself, I have chosen um, the cases I followed. Um, how, how can I then show? How, how can I show them in the film? Um, because there were also other researchers at the time uh, by female journalists, but uh, they were um, too difficult uh, to film because they were much more digital. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it was. It would also, I think, also it would be better for the film. If, would be if it would be more diverse. And uh, why I've chosen um, the editorial of the Süddeutsche Zeitung is actually um, because um, they they did great on in, in past um, um, investigators um, in investigations, for example, the, um, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. Um, and uh, so I thought um, they have like a good energy. And um, I also really liked how they work with whistleblowers. Um, and they also built up the whole editorial quite new. It's not like Der Spiegel, for example, another German um, magazine, which is doing lots of investigations, which um, th they have a, um, a history kind of. But this was um, the editorial of the Süddeutsche Zeitung is uh, much more new and I like the energy and this is why I decided for them. Okay, um, thank you very much for this explanation. Charlotte. Um... You already watched uh, the, the Behind the Headlines documentary. Um, does this film reflect your work? Oh, uh, yeah, I think yes and no. It's, you know, I think there are aspects of investigative journalism that be, can be carried over into my work, definitely. But uh, I and Bellingcat work specifically with open source journalism, so there's definitely some differences there in the way that we treat anonymous sources. So in the movie you see, you know, this it's a, quite a big theme is how do we respect our source and its anonymity while still being able to have reliability and be able to verify what we're using for our work. And that's very different from what we do, which is using open sources that anybody can use to corroborate what we're doing and trying to stay away as much as possible from using any kind of an anonymous source. So it's a very different kind of journalism. Um, but then in the process of trying to verify something from a source that we don't know or that is just an anonymous source online, we go through some similar processes to what we saw in the movie. So um, you would also say that you are also um, um, uh, they mentioned it in the in the trailer too that um, um, they rely very much on whistleblowers. So is this also true for you, Burke? Yeah. So it's a different kind of whistleblower, but it's a similar process where you have information that's been leaked online, 
and we uh, are an investigative entity that believes in using information that's been found online regardless of where it came from. So anything that has been leaked, if it's a database, if it's some kind of information, video, image that's been put out there and already broadcasted to the public that we can gain access to legally, openly, easily, then we'll use it for our research as well. And that is a form of whistleblowing, right? If you're someone who's speaking truth to power and sharing something that may be a larger authority or larger power doesn't want to be seen, then you are whistleblowing in a way, but it's not the same as one individual really going out on a limb and sharing something as um, privately with another researcher as opposed to just putting it on the internet. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, I would be interested to um, uh, get more information about your daily work. So can you maybe give us a concrete example of what your work looks like? Um, what investigation are you maybe very proud of? Um, and um, maybe you can describe briefly how you conducted uh, this, uh, this investigation. So this open source journalism has so many different kind of facets and so many different potential avenues to go down with research. You see that a lot with the wide variety of research that we publish and that we have on the site. But for me personally, my, uh, I, mean, I could talk about a project I worked on last year, which was with looking at police violence, the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States. And that was in collaboration with Forensic Architecture. We compiled over a thousand incidents, looking at videos and images that were being taken at the protests, showing some kind of violence towards the public, whether that was pepper spray, tear gas, physical assault, arrest, detainment, um, et cetera. And then we put them all into a map where we were able to show with an interactive platform where each of these events had happened and when they had happened. So it was uh, plotted in both time and space. And then you could go through and look at each event in each source if you wanted to. The idea being that we wanted to show that this was widespread and systemic because there was a narrative, especially towards the beginning of the protest. And I think with police behavior and accountability in general in the United States, that this is you know, one officer or one department, or you know, it's just a few people and that most people within the force are actually very you know, good for the community and good for society. And, I don't want to give my opinion on that, but regardless, this was intended to demonstrate that this wasn't just that one protest in Minneapolis or one event in Portland. This happened almost systemically at every single protest across the entire country. So it's something that's embedded into the way that these uh, organizations work. But uh, I don't know if that really answered your question. In terms of open source research, I mean, we do a lot of work on social media, so spending a lot of time looking at images and videos compiling as many different corroborating uh, media pieces we can, and then taking the time to verify them individually by locating where each video took place, by using a third party source like Google Maps or Google Earth, and then um, putting it all together into a narrative, which ties back into more traditional journalism, and that's where we rely heavily on our editors to decide what, what story we want to tell with all this information. Okay, um, thanks for, for, for these insights. Um, Daniel, um, seeing your trailer, uh, the work of investigators looked like somehow, um, I would say, like an action thriller. <laughs> it looks like a, a very, uh, a very um, um, dangerous life um, of journalists. Um, how much action was really involved during uh, your research? And, um, how did you work observing them um, actually look like? So in other words, what was the challenge to make the film um, in regard of all these um, action scenes? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think investigative journalism in generally uh, yeah, is, um, doesn't have so much action uh, like we showed in the movie because of course we uh, put everything, all the interesting moments together. Um, but um, don't forget, uh, we filmed for over two years 
So um, yeah, there were quite some time for for some some action moments. Um, so um, what was the question? Um, how, how how I work, right? Um, or what was the biggest difficulty also? So um, I decided to make a direct cinema movie because I wanted. Um, um, I doesn't want that um, the journalists just speak about their work. I wanted really to show how they work, and um, this is um, this is why I, why I cho have chosen this form. And but there um, through that um, it was also um, very very difficult because uh, how journalists work most of the time they are sitting in front of a computer, um, a PC or a laptop or notebook and um as researching or they are on the phone so um we we needed a lot of a uh, patient to do that movie um on the one term as we were um, in the editorial when we were uh, waiting for most of the time and um, just went into the room and um, yeah trying to check out if there's something interesting because sometimes you make a movie where you know ah, okay this is an interesting moment or this is now something interesting um, has happened but there I was for example for two weeks in the editorial and never knew when uh, when is uh, something interesting or the right sentences um, will be spoken um, so um, that was quite challenging and um, um, this was also one reason uh, we, we wanted to shoot the movie in one year, but um, we had um, afterwards, um, yeah, it, it were two years, so we had to extend the whole um, shooting period. And um, what was also difficult is um, that there were lots of things uh, which we couldn't uh, film because um, um, there were sensitive um, informations um, told, for example, um, or when they the journalists meet uh, their sources, we couldn't follow them. So um, I, I needed to find solutions. How can I build um, up the, the whole story? How can I show it um, without uh, showing specific scenes or specific moments? Um, so yeah, but that also made the um, the whole film interesting for me as a filmmaker. Um, yeah, sounds sounds really challenging. <laughs> um, and Daniel, um, in the film, we uh, you mentioned it uh, actually, um, but I want to dig a little bit deeper in this part uh, in terms of um, how you deal with this practically. Um, in the in the film, we saw. Um, the investigator with uh, dealing with highly confidential information and only few people um, also within the organization um, of the Süddeutsche Zeitung um, were, um, have been involved um, into the ongoing research. So what did this fact mean um, for your work practically? Um... Yeah, practic practically, um, that uh, meant uh, that we that there was a need of lots of trust, um, and we prepared this project for one year. Um, I traveled um, for one year to the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and we discussed how we can make sure that no informations will leak out. Um, how we gonna make the movie and. Um, also, we need a time to um, to build this kind of trust, uh, which were needed for the whole project. Um, and so we developed during the filming process later, we developed um, kind of language um, that I knew uh, when they don't want it to be filmed because it um, because there were um, yeah specific names um, which um, which they don't want to have on the material. For example, sometimes they also raised a hand and said, just stop for a second. Then they just told some names or some informations and then we could go on filming directly. Um, but uh, we, uh, as the filmmakers, had also make um, ha have had to make sure that no informations leak out from others from our side. Um, so we worked really um, with um, um, and encrypted hard drives and um, the, um, the, the editing station was not on the internet um, and we blurred like from the beginning on when we got the, um, 
the material to our editing room. We blurred like specific persons, which um, um, we don't want it to show that just for the in the case that some of the material leaked out, um, nobody know um, who who those persons are. And um, also um, for the Ibiza material of the Ibiza investigation, we had it for a long time in a safe in the Süddeutsche Zeitung um, and had then afterwards just one um, transportation of the hard drives uh, through Germany. Um, yeah, and every, everything was encrypt, um, did, encrypted, decrypted. So it was pretty safe, but uh, we were um, still worrying. Okay. I can imagine. Charlotte, um, uh, talking about protecting sources, um, how do you deal um, in your daily work with this? And um, maybe with, uh, with um, uh, telling us more about this, maybe you can uh, also tell us um, how you um, would describe open source journalism from your perspective. Sure. <clears throat> okay, so We'll start with your first question. Open source journalism is journalism that uses almost entirely open sources, the so sources that are free and accessible to the public. This means anything that can be found online most of the time, but also means traditional media, traditional journalism, uh, traditional research methods like books and papers and anything that is open, essentially. So we don't anonymously interview witnesses at the scene and we don't use anything that's been given to us exclusively or um, that's, yeah, th the same way we saw in the movie, like a kind of whistleblower, anonymous hard drive that's handed to us. This is true for 99% of the work that we do. And how we deal with sources when they are anonymous then is very different from the process that's described in the movie and by Daniel because we don't have the same kind of anonymous sources to protect. So it's not someone handing you a hard drive and you know, having to be very careful with not tying it back to that individual. But we do have instances where anonymous users will share something on the internet. So it'll be tied to a username, maybe it's their real name, maybe it's some kind of virtual identity, and they'll share a video of something that's occurred to them or that's happening in the moment. And then we have to decide as an open source journalism entity that relies heavily on our transparency in order to validate our work, whether or not we're going to use any information about the user when we're sharing the article. So to give you a concrete example, uh, in the work that we did with Black Lives Matter, we were looking specifically at people who had shared videos on Twitter and we were heavily deciding whether or not to broadcast that person's information. So, you know, their Twitter account, the username that was linked to it, the direct link that goes back to their account, because we ran into an ethical problem of amplification where we didn't want to amplify someone's voice who potentially was just sharing this for their local community or for their friends and didn't intend for it to be broadcasted by an investigative entity who was going to put it into a platform that would be seen by potentially a lot more people. So we manage that difficulty by only including source links to anything that already had more than a thousand views on it with the assumption that if it was already seen over a thousand times, our platform wasn't going to amplify it by a lot more than that. And yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's difficult when you work with anything that's posted online because there's an assumption that they've already consented to making it public, but making something public, you know, in one way is not the same thing as broadcasting it for an investigative entity in another way. It has a completely different purpose when you're sharing it with just your friends. And that's something that we run into a lot and that, you know, we, we try to grapple with because we also don't necessarily want to ask an anonymous source for information or for consent from them directly. So it's a continuing problem in open source journalism, how to protect sources even when they've already made themselves public in a way. And um, maybe uh, one, one, one more question about this, because I think um, this all comes, comes also with trust. So I think trust is a very important part in, in this field. So how can you trust your sources? 
Yeah, so it's very, again, different. I would say it's almost opposite to what Daniel's talking about. You know, we, there's almost an inherent distrust in the kind of verification work that we do. We're not, you know, taking something, a video that's been posted online that claims it's from Aleppo, Syria and saying, yes, we trust that this is from the right location at the right time and we're going to use it for our work because we're trusting the user that posted it. Instead, we go through many checks and steps to make sure that the video is what it claims to be. So we're doing entirely independent verification of the location by using identifying features in the video. We're trying to corroborate the exact time and date that something took place by looking at details in the satellite imagery by corroborating any kind of destruction or doing shadow analysis. And then with open source work, we're trying to get as many different videos from as many different sources as possible so that even if you have one very biased source sharing something, potentially you have another video or another image showing the same thing from a you know completely different source, a completely different bias, a different level of anonymity. So it's, it's not relying on trusting the source at all, because as we know, you know, anything that's posted online these days can be manipulated, can be recycled, can be from a different time. So it's going through the checks to make sure that everything we use is reliable and verifiable for our work and also for future cases, maybe even legal cases. So yeah, there's, there's not a lot of inherent trust there, but I think there's a lot of optimism in anything you find online being able to be used in an investigation. Okay, thank you very much. So I see we, we are uh, um, nearly running out of time. So this is why I would, <laughs> I, I want to, to, I have so many more questions. Um, Daniel, um, uh, let's, let's try to, 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 um, to answer as much as possible. So, um, but this is maybe a hard one. So how big is the responsibility of investigative journalists and uh, in, uh, in which regards and in this regard, uh, which responsibility did you have portraying um, their work? Um, uh, yeah, I think the responsibility of uh, investigative journalists is um, is pretty big, but um, they can also just uh, do uh, their job actually and try their best. But um, I think it is also, it's not just uh, the responsibility of the um, investigative journalist, but also um, of the editorials and of the fin 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 finance, um, financial um, structures actually. Um, because what you need um, for investigative journalism is time um, and also manpower or woman power um, and uh, that costs money. Um, so uh, what I wish for many newspapers is um, that um, they would um, um, yeah, build, um, build up their um, editorials with um, investigative journalists. So um, it's just, I, I think it's more about the structure um, that um, that they can work freely and have enough time and um, in, yeah to do them their researches. Um, and for myself, I mean, I I don't think that it is um, my film is the film about investigative journalism. It's a film, and um, of course, um, as a filmmaker, you always have a responsibility. Um, and but I didn't f I, I didn't felt like during the process that in this time and at this specific film it's bigger than than normal um, or before um, and um, yeah and I mean also the form uh, direct cine cinema is a, a very honest form so I didn't work at, at this film with um, yeah <clears throat> any um, um, a special form or I just um, yeah gave a, a very honest look into um, into their work so um, yeah so I I, I, I wasn't um, I wasn't uh, under pressure on like um, that that I have to do something right or wrong or I don't know <laughs> <laughs> understand so it's it's also a different format obviously so <laughs> um 
um, one one more question to you, Daniel. Um, in your your film, there um, is the death of two investigative journalists mentioned. Um, how dangerous is this job, and what does it take to be an investigative journalist, in your perspective? Um, yeah. I mean, how dangerous <laughs> is this job? I think um, that depends uh, in which country do you live. Um, um, and in, in Europe, uh, what I think and thought and hope is um, that journalists are pretty safe. But um, even in Germany, there were more and more um, attacks, like just in the past um, few months. Um, so, but there are other parts in the world uh, where it's uh, very different. So I think, yeah, um, it's, um, of course, it's a, in, in many parts of the world, it's a very dangerous job. Um, and so, yeah, this is also like maybe one, one of the things you'll need to be a, a, as an investigative journalist is brave and you have to be persevering, but also passionate um, about um, about your story. And um, I think it's also a job where you have um, where you have to be very diligent because um, you have to fact check a lot and you need to network a lot. Um, but you also have to be empathic to um, make the people to trust you to give your information. So it's very complex, complex actually. Um, and, but this is also what I think make, uh, make it, makes it, uh, interesting. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Daniel. Charlotte, um, what role plays diversity in your work at Bellingcat? Yeah, I think, I, I think it plays a really big role anytime you're trying to tell diverse stories, right? And that is the goal. I think it's the most interesting thing that we can all do right now is tell different and diverse stories. So we're trying um, more and more, especially as we expand to become more diverse in not only the people we have doing these investigations and in the kinds of sources we use, the kinds of organizations we work with, but also the parts of the world that we're shining a light on, the different stories that we're telling and who's involved. So I think it's a it's a big part of my work and our work and something we're constantly thinking about because I think it's it's not even, you know, it, it, it never should be to check some kind of a box. It's quite literally because it's the most interesting thing you can do. It's the, I think it's what people want to know about. We live in a globalized society where you can tell a story about something that's happening in a remote place of the world that you've never been to that's much more exciting in some ways than telling a story about something um, that everyone else is talking about or that you, you know, is, has been widely covered. So how can we uncover and look into things that are more uh, remote and maybe more hidden than your, uh, than other stories? So yeah, it's, it's a big, big part of what we're doing right now and how we're trying to work. Okay, so and I have now, um, thank you very much uh, so far. I have two last questions, one to Charlotte and one to Daniel. Charlotte, um, um, the last question to you, um, I want to ask you um, if you um, briefly can, if you can briefly describe um, how you see the role and uh, especially the practice of investigative journalism evolving in the upcoming years. What are the upcoming challenges? Yes. Sure. I mean, I can only speak more so on the open source investigative journalism side. And I think, well, first of all, I think journalism as a whole, as we've already seen, is relying more and more on things that are shared online, things that are open sources, trying to figure out how to verify evidence that can be found on the internet is a huge part of journalism now. and will only become more important. So I, um, yeah, I would, I would highlight that that's something that's going to be uh, more widespread as we go. But then in terms of a challenge or something that's new and different, I think video manipulation is something that gets brought up a lot. It's less 
pressing or maybe immediate a problem than some people believe it to be, but it is something to be cautious of and thinking of nonetheless when you're thinking of deep fakes or any other kind of manipulation, quite honestly, just much better recycling efforts, much better um, ways at clipping or editing certain videos to hide different moments. So anything that comes to manipulation of content in that way is going to be something that us as investigative journalists have to stay a step ahead of and be able to recognize and maybe even have a gut instinct or intuition for as this field progresses and as people get better at that kind of manipulation. And I think if I could add to that, actually a second challenge related to working with anything online is actually the attacks that you'll now receive. I think in the past, you know, attacks were uh, always difficult for anybody in any field, but particularly for journalists to receive. And now the tools that are at hand of anybody who doesn't like your story is a lot bigger. There's, you know, bot campaigns, there's trolling, there's spamming. I think any female journalist who's on the internet right now knows the problems of being a visible female journalist and having to deal constantly with what that means in terms of, you know, people in your messages and spams and bots and trolls and those kinds of attacks that you have to field now on a day to day basis um, because you work in such a public and accessible online space. So those two things are, are something that we'll have to manage and continue with. Thank you very much, um, uh, Charlotte, for, for the statement. And uh, now, Daniel, I want to ask you my very last question. <laughs> and um, since this is a, a doc festival and um, you, you um, uh, are working as a documentary filmmaker as well as a journalist, so I, I, I would be interested in uh, what have documentary filmmakers and investigative journalists in your perspective in common? Is there something uh, what you would say um, is, is very similar in their work or are they completely uh, not comparable? Uh, both are looking for a good story, actually. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I think there are similarities, but um, there are also things which are very different. Um, yeah, for example, that um, documentary filmmakers um, are looking more for emotions and investigative journalists are looking more for facts and information. So, um, but I think um, there are some things uh, what they have in common also during the work that um, um, that um, yeah, you you always have like for a story your protagonist um, and you try um, to tell your story um, as much close to your protagonists as possible. Um, but still, uh, journalists um, have to show like all the sides, um, all different perspectives. And um, as a documentary filmmaker, I can, for example, just show uh, one perspective. So, um, yeah, this, that, that was both a little bit like what we have in common and uh, the differences. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so this was it with my questions. Um, I think we have three minutes left. Uh, and I see there are two questions from the audience. Um, I will start with uh, the question of, uh, I, I'm, 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 I hope I, I spelled the name correctly, Christian Aurora. <laughs> Um, is uh, there legislation in Germany that makes the work of investigative journalism difficult? And do you think your film will contribute to the discussion about such laws? I think this is a question to Daniel. Um, we, we have a very free media in Germany. And um, I, think, um, I think we have bigger problems with laws um, for um, whistleblowers, actually, because um, they, are, they are not uh, secured enough. Um, we don't have... Um, yeah, they, they need to to be protected more actually, and they are, um, for example, because lots of uh, whistleblowers they have to leave their job often and um, or afterwards, 
um, it's impossible for them to to get into to get another job actually. So um, I see there in Germany um, bigger problems um, for the whistleblowers than for the investigative journalists. Okay, thank you. So Charlotte, we have only one minute thirty left for the very last question from Francesco Bizzari. Um, I, I hope the spelling was correctly. In 2019, I invited Bellingcat Truth in a post-truth world to my festival, uh, Vision della Mondi Milan. Uh, investigative journalism is one of the pillar themes of the festival. I'd like, uh, I'd also like to invite uh, this new documentary. Um, question: Are there some Italian journalists uh, that are part of Bellingcat? Uh, no, not at the moment. I, well, Bell and Cat is um, a collective, so we have about 20 staff, full-time journalists who work as investigators and trainers. But then we're we're much bigger um, in terms of our collaborators, contributors, volunteers. So I'm almost positive we have people who have worked on investigations for us who are Italian. Um, I can't think of his name right now, but I know there is someone who did work on an investigation for us, but he's not an official part of the you know, Bell and Cat the company, but he's a part of Bell and Cat the community. So yes and no, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think we are now at the end of the session. Um, I want to thank you for, for um, the dense insights you gave us um, um, into your work and um, the background to, to the film. Thank you very much. Um, for me, it was very interesting. Um, um, yeah, so I wish you all uh, a nice evening and thanks a lot for um, participating in this session. <laughs> thanks for yeah, having thank us. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Great discussion. I love the uh, last words, yes and no. This is probably something we need to question further, but this is exactly what also makes democracy. So I think for the end of the day um, about rebuilding democracy, this was a very good job. Julia, you did a fantastic moderation. Thank you very much to the three of you for being here with us and to close this day, rebuild democracy.